Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Admiral James A. Winnefeld, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Quiet! <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm make doing my Ray Odierno impression. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure this evening for me to be among this distinguished audience and to have the opportunity to honor a very close friend and a first-rate general officer. I would tell you that of all the good fortune that has followed me around the world, I consider none better than to have had Phil Breedlove as a colleague and a friend. I've known friend, uh, Phil excuse me, since the dawn of our military careers, when we were students, fraternity brothers, and friends at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. There you go. Go Jackets. While I can assure you that neither of us imagined that four decades later, we would be in the positions in which we are privileged to serve today, I can tell you for certain that our friends way back then did predict that at least Phil would be successful. <laughs> now, Fred was very kind. He said he'd give me an extra five minutes if I could come up with some dirt on Phil. But I think that there's a reason, three reasons, actually, why I shouldn't do that. First of all, the night isn't getting any younger. Second of all, Phil's lovely wife, Cindy, is with us tonight. And third, Phil gets the last word. So I think I'll just leave it at that. But what an amazing journey for two college buddies to be here with heads of state, business leaders, and country music stars. When I first met Phil, like everyone else, I was taken by his friendly southern drawl, his sharp intellect, his easy sense of humor, and his outgoing personality. It's impossible to not like Phil, and I saw this from day one. That said, we've sometimes found ourselves in very senior forums on opposite sides of a tough issue with gusto. But no matter the resolution, two steps outside the room and Phil and I are back to the old days. Now the Atlantic Council recognizes leaders who best represent the pillars of the transatlantic partnership. And so it's right and proper that they selected Phil for making such exceptional contributions as a military leader to freedom across the Atlantic and around the world. At every point in his career, Phil has built trust and fostered relationships in important positions of responsibility in Europe and Asia, but none more strategically important than those he has skillfully developed among his NATO partners, and particularly in the very last year that has been so difficult with all of the new challenges, the re-emerging challenges that are facing the Alliance today. Of course, his position as SACIR dates back to General Dwight David Eisenhower, who once said, our real problem is not our strength today, but it's rather the vital necessity of action today to ensure our strength tomorrow. Well, Phil advocates for both of those, today and tomorrow, each and every day, with a virtuoso blend of energy, intellect, and collegiality. He's an extraordinary leader with high moral character and unflinching dedication to the people and relationship that propel his mission. And most importantly, he has a deep passion for the men and women, regardless of nationality, who serve the cause of freedom everywhere. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my very great privilege to present the Atlantic Council's Distinguished Military Leadership Award to my dear friend and colleague, General Philip Breedlove. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. I, I must say one always worries a little when his college fraternity brother starts talking about him in public. <laughs> what an honor it is to have such a great American and a true friend here tonight. Sandy, you know how highly I respect you. I, I will tell you that uh, 
Sandy is brilliant. When we were at Georgia Tech, I studied hard to get my B's and C's, and, Dan and Sandy drank a lot of beer in red Solo cups. <laughs> and he got straight A's, so I, I don't know. It is uh, an honor to serve uh, with such a fine leader and, and a great friend, and uh, thank you, Sandy. Governor Huntsman, uh, Fred, thank you for all you, your efforts in continuing to promote transatlantic unity. This amazing institution is doing incredible work every day. Additionally, allow me to extend my congratulations and my appreciation to Ms. Marilyn Hewson, Mr. Toby Keith, and President Ghani. As a NATO commander with troops in Afghanistan who are supporting the Afghan security forces as they build a strong and secure future for the Afghan people, it's a particular honor to share this evening with Mr. Ghani's uh, thoughts and his daughter, Miriam. It's always humbling to be recognized for simply doing what I love with the people that I love. Being a part of this particular group is, well, it's a pretty big deal for a Georgia boy whose father, who I love, graduated from the fifth grade. It's also humbling considering the previous recipients of this award. None, none is more important in my mind, nor dear to me, than the 2012 winners, the enlisted men and women of our armed forces. With, I was going to ask you to do that with me in a couple of sentences, but we'll just get it over with now. Maybe we'll do it again. Without these great people and without the sacrifices that they and their families make every day all around the globe, the freedom we enjoy would flat not be possible. So let's give them another hand. As you know, the freedoms our military men and women are protecting together with our transatlantic allies and partners, we're now facing renewed challenges by those who would use violence and, and alter international norms, boundaries, and institutions. In Europe, chief among these is a revanchist Russia embarked on a far-reaching revision of what once were shared hopes for a stable and mutually beneficial partnership. A quarter of a century ago, the dark days of the Cold War gave way to the fall of the Berlin Wall and all it represented. In its place emerged genuine hope for a new friendship, a new partnership, and the prospect of a Europe whole, free, at peace, and prosperous. We broke with confrontation and pursued a policy of cooperation. And for a long time, many of us believed that Russia would also embrace that cooperation. But as we look back, there were clear signs that Russia was on a different path. In the early 1990s, Russia stoked separatist tensions in enclaves of its newest neighbors, Georgia and Moldova. In 2007, Russia suspended observance of the conventional forces in Europe treaty. In 2008, Russian forces invaded Georgia. All along, Russia continued to clamp down on the freedoms of its own people. All of these were signals of a changing Russia, breaking with the principles and the values of the West. Through it all, we remained optimistic and continued to treat Russia as a, value, a valued and trusted partner. But last year, this optimism faded. Russia's actions against Ukraine both this year and last have signaled a clear end to what I see as two decades of internal Russian struggle over security policy. They have shown that Russia is on a far different course, one that shifts the relationship between Russia and the West from one of strategic cooperation to one of strategic competition one that employs all, all the elements of national power. 
one that is not a temporary aberration, but a new norm. One that reflects a long-term commitment sustained by long-term plans for their resource allocation. This is a Russia that recognizes strength and sees weakness as an opportunity. This strategic competition requires a new mindset and a new approach. The U.S. and NATO must adapt, and I'm happy to report that we are adapting. The stakes are high, but we should not shy away from that because, frankly, Russia is not shying away from that. We must keep the dialogue open with Russia, but we must talk from a position of strength. We must embrace cooperation wherever our mutual interests align, but we must also ensure that we are ready to compete. We have always competed well, and this time should be no different. Our alliance is strong, and it gives us the ability to compete successfully against current and future challenges. Winning this strategic competition and preserving the international order we have all worked so hard to build means a number of things. It means challenging Russia's current policies and demonstrating that Putin's current approach will not be allowed to damage our security. It means deterring Russia by carefully shaping Moscow's choices and managing Putin's confidence. And it means continuing to lead courageously as an alliance and as a nation. The great news is that our alliance is rock solid. We are standing together. At the whale summits, the alliance recommitted itself to collective defense in the face of any threat. The Warsaw summit will equally be important in shaping our alliance's future. As we look toward Warsaw and beyond, it is imperative that we hold firm, united, and resolved. We must communicate our interests and policies clearly, in words and in action. We must lead, lead along the path that dissuades and deters Russia. And all the while, we must leave the door open for Russia's return as a nation that respects and abides by international norms, a contributor to Europe's security and prosperity. We look forward to that day. Russia has everything to gain. The fact that we are engaging this frank conversation keeps me hopeful that we will reach that day. The Atlantic Council plays a powerful role in energizing the dialogue, sharpening our thinking, and pointing towards solutions. Because of your efforts and the collective efforts of many of those with us tonight, this important conversation is occurring in our own government, in multilateral arenas, in think tanks, and throughout the NATO alliance. Our debates, our resolve, our unity give me great hope. I'm very proud to be here. I thank you for this award and for all you do for the Transatlantic Alliance. On behalf of all those who serve, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, civilians, and families, yes, our families, on behalf of all of them, I thank you for all you do. Please welcome to the stage former National Security Advisor and Chairman of the Atlantic Council's Brent Scowcroft Center, General James L. Jones. Well, good evening, everybody. I really wish I could tell you that my limping up here on stage is the result of an old war ruin that surface instead of tripping over a hole on the beach in Grand Cayman Islands, but <laughs> we are where we are. Please do not tell the Marine Corps. Please do not tell the Marine Corps. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have the high honor and the great pleasure of introducing the, award, uh, the awardee of the Atlantic Council's 2015 
Distinguished Artistic Leadership Award for his accomplishment as a leader, as a songwriter, as an entertainer, as a businessman, as a philanthropist, and as a patriot, Toby Keith. Bursting in Nashville, out in Nashville in 1993 with his first number one hit, I Should Have Been a Cowboy, Toby has produced more than 31 chart-topping hits, which have won him the Academy of Country Music Entertainer of the Year Award in 2002 and 2003. Toby Keith was well on his way uh, when we met in 2002, when he participated in a free concert uh, for our troops at Constitution Hall. He has regularly volunteered his time uh, through the USO to the cause of entertaining and visiting with our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere around the world, appearing in over 200 shows for military audience, lifting the morale of over 250,000 men and women in uniform, as well as that of their families in over 15 countries and on four ships at sea. Regularly in the combat zones, Toby Keith would finish a great concert in the safer areas where large troop concentrations could gather, and very quietly, with maybe one other member of his entourage, would board a military helicopter and fly out to a forward operating base to spend the night in the field with troops who could not get to the safer areas for the concert. His patriotic songs re reflect his deep appreciation for our men and women in uniform, past and present, courtesy of the red, white, and blue, American soldier, which he will perform tonight, and my personal favorite, Call a Marine. <laughs> Toby's father served in the Army, and his story of service is recounted in Toby's songs as a tribute to America's greatest generation and those who follow in their footsteps. His connection with the troops of today is legendary because they know without any doubt that his love for them is complete and genuine. But there's much more to Toby than his music. His family and friends know him to be a thoughtful and dedicated and loving father and friend and husband to a fault, perhaps the best example of, his, of this quality where his family is concerned is the fact that on the night when he was to be inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of, Hall of Fame in 2007, with thousands of who's who in uh, Oklahoma in attendance, Toby Keith was off coaching his son's football team. Um, and he had planned it so that he could do both, coach the team in the game and go and receive his, his induction into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, the football game went into multiple overtimes. <laughs> the presentation of all the other inductees was progressing quite rapidly. The organizer of the event and I were looking at each other. The reason I was there was I had been asked to introduce him to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, and I was wondering how I was going to get up there and sing one of his songs <laughs> if he didn't show up. At the very last minute, Toby arrived with a proud smile on his face, and the only thing he said was, we won. <laughs> so what's the plan here? That's with 30 seconds to go before his award. Toby Keith has his priorities right. Before announcing his award tonight, just to make sure, I checked that the football schedule in Oklahoma <laughs> was over, uh, just to be safe. So he's here tonight to receive an award which celebrates Toby Keith, the leader, Toby Keith, the artist, and Toby Keith, the man whose music and values are an inspiration to all of us here tonight, an inspiration to our military community, into tens of thousands of fans around the globe. In just a few short weeks, he'll be inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, which is another great honor. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to present the 2015 recipient of the Atlantic Council's Distinguished Artistic Leadership Award to Toby Keith. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
General James Jones, people, right there. Wow. Obviously, y'all didn't get the uh, late memo where this was country chic, not black tie, right? So, my bad, my bad, my bad. I've got a thousand stories on that guy. He has been a dear friend of mine for uh, many, many years, and I begged him a thousand times and, and talked to his beautiful wife, Diane, and all their sons. I wish he would run for president. He speaks like five languages. He knows everybody in the room. He knows everybody in the world. He would be a great leader for this country, and uh, I really love General James John. But he's always told me no. I, I guess it'd be a pay cut or something. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, I'm very humbled and uh, honored to be here tonight. Um, the, the great general um, asked me if I'd be interested in doing this, and, and I will do anything for him. So um, I get here tonight, and I learned a lot. The Atlantic Council, um, you give a great light at the end of the tunnel to a uh, country that a lot of people in the flyover states, like where I live in Oklahoma, as we feel like and sometimes we're er eroding as a as a uh, nation, uh, it's people like in this room tonight that, that give me great hope, and um, you should be commended, and I'm honored to be accepting this award for the Atlantic Council. Um, there's, a, there's a couple more organizations that, that need to be brought to the attention of the 200 and something shows we did in 11 years overseas. That could not have been possible without a wonderful, wonderful organization that gets very little recognition, the USO. The USO, if you're here tonight. Uh, they do so much for so many for so long, and they go unrecognized. And, um, and I'm very humbled to take an award for going and playing for our military because they're so important to me. Uh, I tell this story a lot, but it's worth telling again. My father came home from the war with one eye, and I was 17 or 18 years old before I realized that the gray eye and the blue eye were different. Uh, he never complained. He knew that he did his uh, country a great job, and he instilled it in his children to respect the uh, veterans and the people who go defend our countries and our freedom, all our liberty. And uh, if solicitors came to the door, you met the devil. If a, if a veterans organization came to the door, you come in and were invited in for dinner. And he flew his flag 365. It never flew at half mass because you couldn't lower it. It was just up on top of the pole. <laughs> and, and once in a while, somebody would stop and say, hey, you're in Oklahoma and the wind's 35 mile an hour and your flag's getting a little rusty there. It needs to come down. We need to get a new flag. And he would say, yes, sir. And he'd go out and we'd lower the pole and change the flag again. But uh, he always begged me um, from the time that, um, that I could go perform. He said, you should go perform for the troops. And I was so busy at the time taking care of my career and my family and my livelihood that I said, I'll get to that. And then he passed away in March of 2001, and 911 happened in the fall. And from that point forward for the next 11 years, um, we took off and uh, became USO. My booking agent, uh, Kurt Motley, is here tonight, and um, he became a board member for the USO. And we, he started championing the campaign to get people to go over there and uh, to set the benchmark we went in to the guts of the war, and through meeting all these military people uh, for 11 years, it, it changed our world. And uh, it, was, uh, it was the most wonderful history lesson, geography lesson, and uh, heart lesson that you'll, you'll ever uh, be a part of. And no awards in the world are more important than those awards where you've given back to somebody who's done something beautiful for you as uh, as our military does for us every single day. And, uh, and um, I'm honored and I will go for the rest of my life as long as I can. Uh, 
there's, uh, there's, there's five people that I want to thank that made, that get no recognition, that made every single one of those 200 plus shows. One of them we're going, he's going to perform with me in a minute, Scott Emmert. One of them is uh, my booking agent and a USO board member, Kurt Motley. Brian O'Connell and my assistant, who's not here tonight, uh, Mitch Deny. They made every single show and they get no recognition. I wish you'd give them a round of applause. <laughs> now, I'm not going to go over my four minutes or whatever it is. I'm honored to welcome to the stage with me 12 remarkable individuals who embody the bravery and character that I so admire across the United States military. They represent all four military branches and the thousands of American men and women who are serving around the world. Please join me in thanking them for their service. This is Scotty Emmerich. And while I'm here, I don't know if any are present, I want to thank the Coast Guard also. They also do a great job. wrote this for my uh, father who was in the army, but in honor of all the branches being here tonight, we're going to sing it a little different. I'm just trying to be a father, be a daughter and a son, be a lover to their mother, everything to everyone, a band that I'm bright and early, my business in my suit. Hey, I'm dressed up for success My head down to my boots I don't do it for the money I got bills that I can't pay I don't do it for the glory I just do it anyway Providing for our future It's my responsibility And I'm a real good under pressure Being all that I can be I can't call in sick on Mondays when my weekend's been too strong. Hell, I work straight through my holidays and sometimes all night long. You can bet that I'll stand ready when the wolf growls at the door. Cause I'm solid and I'm steady. Man, I'm true down to my core. I will always do my duty no matter what the price. I've counted up the cost. I know the sacrifice. People, I don't want to die for you. But if dying's asking me, I'll bear that cross with honor. Hey, freedom don't come free. I'm an American soldier, an American. Beside my brothers and my sister, I will proudly take a stand. Jeopardy. I will always do what's right. Man, I'm out here on the front line. Sleep in peace tonight. American soldier. I'm an American soldier. An American warrior, an American Beside my brothers and my sister I will proudly take a stand When liberty's in jeopardy I will always do what's right Man, I'm out here on your front line People sleep in peace tonight American An American, American. 
The Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and the Coast Guard. Me and my family salute you and thank you for our freedom. Godspeed. Scotty, stay out here, and, and Toby, please do as well. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of our honorees and introducers back to the stage for a family photo. If, uh, if, uh, if all our uh, proud men and women in the military could step up on that riser, that'd be just great. Uh, and I want to say one last thanks to Toby Keith, not just for everything he's done in his art and, his, uh, and for the military, uh, but thank you for being tonight and honoring us by letting us honor you along with all the other honorees. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. We hope to see you again next year, October 1st in New York. We'll have our Global Citizens Awards and thank for everything you do for our country and for our alliance and the world and for the Atlantic Council. Thank you. See you again.